Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you are already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today, we are here to talk about my May Book of the Month predictions. <music> All right, everybody, welcome back to another Book of the Month prediction video where I tried to determine what Book of the Month might feature as part of their curated monthly selections or their potential add-on selections. But of course, before we can get into May's, we have to recap how I did in April. Now, I did want to quickly mention that I think I'm going to do something a little bit different going forward after this video. Instead of trying to do this recap at the beginning of the prediction video, I think I'm going to do a short, quick, separate video talking about all of the selections for the month, my thoughts and feelings, how I did, as well as talk about whether I made any selections or whether I decided to pass on this month. So basically as soon as May 1st rolls around and we know what the selections are, I'm going to be doing a brief follow-up video discussing all of those things rather than trying to cram it in at the beginning of every prediction video. So please comment down below and let me know what your thoughts and feelings are on that. It would be a new video series on my channel. So jumping into how I did in April. This was actually a pretty heavy month for Book of the Month because they actually had seven monthly curated selections this time around and I did pretty well if I do say so myself because out of those selections, I correctly predicted six of them. Those six were Darling Girls by Sally Hepworth, Just for the Summer by Abby Jimenez, The Husbands by Holly Gramazio, How to End a Love Story by Yulin Kwong, All We Were Promised by Ashton Lattimore, and The Wives by Simone Garindo. And the only one that I did not predict was a book called Dragon Fruit by Maria Lucier. I had never heard of that book before. It was completely not on my radar at all. So that was nowhere near a prediction that I had made for April. And then in terms of add-ons, Book of the Month had five new add-on selections. And out of those five, three of them I predicted correctly. First, we had The Familiar by Lee Bardugo, Daughter of Mine by Megan Miranda, and Table for Two by Amar Tolls. Those were the three that I predicted correctly. The other two that were featured were The Reappearance of Rachel Price by Holly Jackson. And then the fifth and final add-on was a book called A Short Walk Through a Wide World by Douglas Westerbeck. And I had never heard of that book before. It was just not one that was on my radar. So out of the 12 new monthly curated selections and add-on selections, I correctly predicted nine of them, which I think is my best prediction month so far. I'm usually not that accurate at all. So I was very, very pleased by how April selections panned out. And now we're going to go ahead and just jump right into May's predictions. Now I will say that I do not really have a lot of strong feelings about these predictions y'all. When I was trying to determine what I thought would be featured, I was having a really hard time because I wasn't really feeling passionate about a lot of these. In fact, I think this is going to be one of the shortest book of the month prediction videos yet just because I don't have full categories, I think for pretty much any of them. So it's really unusual. But I will say before we jump into the predictions that there is already a confirmed add-on for May. It is already there and available on book of the month's website. It is a book called Did I Ever Tell You by Genevieve Kingston it is a confirmed add-on and you can already see it on their website. Now just as a few reminders, my book of the month predictions are divided into five distinct genre categories and I limit myself to five selections for each category. Typically not all of the categories are full but there are some months that are heavier than others. All the books that I'm going to be talking about are May releases only. So there is every possibility that there are books that are coming out on April 30th that are going to be featured in May but I'm not going to be talking about those here. And as always we are going to start with the mystery thriller horror genre category. And the very first book that I want to talk to you about is a book called When We Were Silent by Fiona McPhillip. And I'm really loving the idea of this book because this is set at a school, I believe. So it's giving a little bit of dark academia vibes. It says Louise Manson is the newest student at Highfield Manor, Dublin's most exclusive private school. Behind its granite walls are high arched alcoves and oak lined library and the dark secret Lou has come to expose. Lou's working class status makes her the consummate outsider until she is befriended by some of her beautiful and wealthy classmates. But after Lou attempts to bring the school's secret to light, her time at Highfield ends with a lifeless body sprawled at her feet. 30 years later, Lou gets a shocking phone call. A high profile lawyer is bringing a lawsuit against the school and needs Lou to testify. Lou will have to confront her past and discover once and for all what really happened at Highfield. Powerful and compelling when we were silent as a thrilling story of exploitation, privilege, and retribution. I'm absolutely here for it. I'm loving the vibes. I'm loving kind of like the dark academia feel. And I would be excited to see this one featured on Book of the Month. This next one was also intriguing. It's a little bit more on the literary side. So it's gonna be like a literary thriller. It's called The Winner by Teddy Wayne. I have never heard of this author before. I do not believe it is a debut, but Book of the Month has featured literary thrillers in the past, which is one of the reasons why I selected it for this category. It says, Connor O'Toole has never been anywhere as casually glamorous as Cutter's Neck, a gated community near Cape Cod. It's a sweet deal for the summer, free lodging in a guest cottage in exchange for tennis lessons, luxuriously far from the cramped Yonkers apartment he shares with his diabetic mother. Then a sharp-tongued divorcee appears, offering him double his usual rate. Soon he realizes Catherine is expecting additional off-the-court services for her money, and Connor tumbles into a secret erotic affair unlike anything he's experienced before. Despite his 
steamy flings with a woman twice his age, he simultaneously finds himself falling for the artsy outspoken girl he met on the beach. Connor somehow finds a way to manage this tangled web until he makes one final irreversible mistake. A dark, explosive literary thriller that brilliantly skewers the elite. Whiting Award winner Tenny Wayne's unputdownable novel is cinematic, shocking, and a psychological masterpiece. So like I said, this is definitely a little bit more literary in nature and it sounds like it's going to have some darker themes. There's going to be like an affair involved and this definitely sounds like it's going to be rich people behaving badly. So if you enjoy those types of stories, be on the lookout for this one on Book of the Month. Next we have a dark domestic thriller that is coming out in May that I think could potentially be featured on Book of the Month. It is called The Switch by Lily Sampson. It says when young couple Elena and Adam are offered the chance to house sit in their dream neighborhood for a few months, they jump at the opportunity. The leafy South London enclave is a world away from everything they know, complete with grand homes, lush gardens, and quaint local coffee shops. Soon Elena crosses paths with the beautiful and enigmatic artist Sophia and her husband Finn, and she and Adam are pulled into their orbit. Sophia is everything Elena isn't. Glamorous, alluring, successful, and Finn exerts a mysterious pull on Elena that she can't seem to shake. Elena's infatuation with Finn grows stronger by the day, and when Sophia proposes a thrilling game to her new friend to swap partners in secret, Elena quickly agrees. It's not long before Elena experiences a sexual awakening that blossoms into an illicit love affair, but Sophia's plans are far more dangerous than Elena could ever have imagined. So I'm not necessarily entirely sure how I feel about that. There's definitely going to be cheating involved, or at least, you know, swapping partners, and that's typically not my vibe, but it definitely seems like there's going to be a darker undertone here in that one of the wives has something further planned. So that is definitely twisty. That's definitely a little bit salacious. And like I said, it is certainly going to be on the darker side. So I'm not necessarily sure how strongly I feel about this one being featured, but I've seen it going around. So I wanted to mention it here. The final one that I wanted to mention here is The Return of Ellie Black by Amiko Jean. Now I believe this is her adult thriller debut. I think she's more known for her contemporary romance, maybe even young adult contemporary romance. So I was really intrigued to see this book by her, but it is really popular. And based on some clues that I've seen going around, like released by Book of the Month, I do think that this is a very, very strong contender. I'm just going to read this quick blurb. It says, Detective Chelsea Calhoun's life is turned upside down when she gets the call that Ellie Black, a girl who disappeared years earlier, has resurfaced in the woods of Washington State. But Ellie's reappearance leaves Chelsea with more questions than answers. And it does say the debut thriller from New York Times bestselling author Amiko Jean, The Return of Ellie Black is both a feminist tour de force about the embers of hope that burn in the aftermath of tragedy and a twisty page turner that will shock and surprise you right up until the final page. I don't know, that actually sounds really wonderful. I've never read anything by Amiko Jean, but I'm incredibly interested to see where this girl has been, why she's returning, what's going on with this detective. And I always love a good thriller set in Washington State because it is so, so, so atmospheric. A lot of Jennifer Hillier's thrillers are set in Washington State. I absolutely love it. So this is certainly one that I'm very hyped for and I will absolutely grab it if it is featured on Book of the Month in May. All right, moving on into the romance category, there are actually quite a few cute romances coming out. And one that I think is a shoe in to be featured on Book of the Month is going to be the newest release by Christina Lauren called The Paradise Problem. Christina Lauren's last latest release was featured on Book of the Month and I definitely think that they will be featured again especially because they are a very beloved writing duo. They are very very popular in the romance sphere. It says Anna Green thought she was marrying Liam West Weston for access to subsidized family housing while at UCLA. She also thought she'd sign divorce papers when the graduation caps were tossed and they both went on their merry ways. Three years later Anna is a starving artist living paycheck to paycheck while West is a Stanford professor. He may be one of four heirs to the Weston Foods conglomerate but he has little interest in working for the heartless corporation his family built from the ground up. He is interested however in his one hundred million dollar inheritance. There's just one catch. Due to an antiquated clause in his grandfather's will, Liam won't see a penny until he's been happily married for five years. Okay, so we've got that standard trope of like fake dating, fake marriage to get the inheritance, right? Just when Liam thinks he's in the home stretch, pressure mounts from his family to see this mysterious spouse and he has no choice but to turn to the one person he's afraid to introduce to his one percenter parent, his unpolished not so ex-wife. But in the presence of his family, Liam's fears quickly shift from whether the feisty foul mouth paint splattered Anna can play the part to whether the toxic world of wealth will corrupt someone as pure of heart as his surprisingly grounded and loyal wife. Liam will have to ask himself if the price tag on his flimsy cover story is worth losing true love that sprouted from a lie. Okay, so we definitely have some of those very, very familiar tropes that we've been seeing a lot, fake dating or fake marriage of convenience or inheritance, things like that. So if you love Christina Lauren and you're excited about this newest release, definitely be on the lookout for this one on Book of the Month in May. Another strong romance contender, I think, is going to be the newest release by Paige Toon called Seven Summers. One of her former releases was also featured on Book of the Month, and so I wouldn't be surprised to see her featured at all. I've never actually read anything by Paige Toon. So please let me know if you have read anything by her and what you think of her stories because I could potentially be convinced to pick some up. Liv and Finn meet six summers ago working in a bar on the rugged Cornish coastline. Their future is full of promise. When a night of passion ends in devastating tragedy, they are bound together inextricably. But Finn's life in LA with his band and Liv's is in Cornwall with her family. So they make a promise. Finn will return every year and if they are single, they will spend the summer together. This summer, Liv crosses paths with Tom, a mysterious new arrival in her hometown. They find themselves falling for one another. For the first time, Liv can imagine a world where her heart isn't broken every autumn. Now Liv must make an impossible choice. And 
when she discovers the shocking reason that Tom has left home, she'll need to trust her heart even more. Okay, so here we have that trope where we have two potential love interests who only see each other once a year. They probably don't have any communication outside this once a year meeting, but then one of the love interests, Liv, is going to find somebody else. I'm not necessarily sure if there's going to be a love triangle in here. We all kind of know how I feel about the love triangle dynamic, but this does have really good ratings so far. It's got a 4.41 with 1,717 ratings already on Goodreads. And so I'm actually really, really intrigued by this. Like I said, please let me know if you've read Page Tune in the past and let me know what you think, because I'm always looking for a great romance author who can do those harder hitting elements really, really well. And I'm just loving the sound of this one. So I would love to see this one featured on Book of the Month. And then this last one that I want to talk about in this category is just one that sounded absolutely adorable. So I wanted to go ahead and talk about it here. It's a book called Love at First Book by Jen McKinley. It says, when a librarian moves to a quaint Irish village where her favorite novelist lives, the last thing she expects is to fall for the author's prickly son until their story becomes one for the books from the New York Times bestselling author of Summer Reading. So again, this is an author that I'm really not familiar with at all. This one sounded really sweet and it's surrounding books and writing and a love story. And I just wanted to go ahead and mention it here. So again, another one to keep an eye out for in May. All right, moving into the literary slash contemporary fiction category. First, we have a contemporary fiction called Summer After Summer by Lauren Bailey. It says Olivia Taylor's marriage is in a death spiral when she agrees to come home to the Hamptons to help her father and sisters pack up the family estate. If it looks like she's running away from her soon-to-be ex Wes and New York City, well she is. But someone has to take care of things and that's always been Olivia's role in the family. After years of financial trouble, someone's finally bailing them out with a huge offer to buy their beachfront property, which is a good thing, although it means losing the home she grew up in where her mother died and where she first met Fred, the love of her life. It's been five years since the last time things blew up between Olivia and Fred, but much longer since the first time. At this point, Olivia fears it was never meant to be, so there's no reason to feel butterflies in her stomach at the idea of seeing him again. They've already tried and tried again and again, but she's newly single and she isn't the same person she was the last time, and Fred has changed too. So this is definitely a book that could be categorized as like chick lit, women's fiction. This is definitely giving me a little bit of like Ellen Hildebrand vibes, and we all know that Book of the Month loves featuring Ellen Hildebrand. So that is one of the reasons why I selected this book for this category is because it definitely seems like something that Book of the Month would feature. So I certainly would not be surprised to see this one featured in this category on Book of the Month in May. Next we have what seems like is going to be a more harder hitting literary fiction. It is called Long After We Are Gone by Tara Shelton Harris. It says, don't let the white man take the house. These are the last words King Solomon says to his son before he dies. Now all four Solomon siblings must return to North Carolina to save the kingdom, their ancestral home, and 200 acres of land from a development company who has their sights set on turning the valuable waterfront property into a luxury resort. While fighting to save the kingdom, the siblings must also save themselves from the secrets they've been holding on to. Junior, the oldest son and married to his wife for 11 years, is secretly in love with another man. Second son Mance can't control his temper, which has landed him in prison more than once. Cece, the oldest daughter and a lawyer in New York City, has embezzled thousands of dollars from her firm's clients. Youngest daughter Toki wonders why she doesn't seem to fit into this family, which has left an aching hole in her heart that she tries to fill in harmful ways. As the Solomons come together to fight for the kingdom, each of their facades begin to crumble and collide in unexpected ways. Told in alternating viewpoints, Long After We Are Gone is a searing portrait on the power of family and letting go of things that no longer serve you, exploring the burden of familial expectations the detriment of miscommunication and the lessons and legacies we pass on to our children. So I'm absolutely loving the sound of this. This sounds like it's definitely going to be a very complicated family drama with complex sibling dynamics. Each one of them is hiding something. They're having to return home to deal with the estate of their father and like everything is going to come out. Y'all know that I love harder hitting character driven stories like that. And I definitely think that this is a strong contender because Book of the Month loves to feature these harder hitting family dramas, especially those that are coming from marginalized voices. I'm actually very intrigued by this one. I would love to see it on Book of the Month in May. Next, Next we have another contemporary fiction. This one seems like it's going to contain some social commentary on social media. It is a book called Allow Me to Introduce Myself by Oni Nwabaneli. It says, Anuri Chinasa has had enough. And really, who can blame her? She was the unwilling star of her stepmother's social media empire before mom influencers were even a thing. For years, Ophelia documented every birthday, every skin knee, every milestone, and meltdown for millions of strangers to fawn over and pick apart. Now, at 25, Anuri is desperate to put her way too public past behind her and start living on her own terms. But it's not going so great. She can barely walk down the street without someone recognizing her and the fraught relationship with her father has fallen apart. Then there's her PhD application still unfinished and her drinking problem still going strong. When every detail of her childhood was so intensely scrutinized, how can she tell what she really wants? Still, Ophelia is never far away and has made it clear she won't go down without a fight. With Noelle, Anuri's five-year-old half-sister now being forced down the same path, Anuri discovers she has a new mission in life to take back control of the family narrative. Through biting wit and heartfelt introspection, the starkly humorous story dives deeply into the deceptive allure of a picture-perfect existence, the overexposure of children in social media and the excitement of self-discovery. So that definitely seems like it's going to have heavy commentary on the price we pay for a very public social media existence and trying to curate the picture perfect existence for that social media presence. This is another one that's really interesting. I feel like this could be very pertinent and relevant to our current times. So I 
thought that this was a good one that could be featured on Book of the Month in May. And then the very final one that I have for this category is actually one that recently came on my radar and it sounds very, very interesting the way that it's being told. So this is a book called Oye by Melissa McGoyan and it says that it is structured as a series of one-sided phone calls from our spunky, sarcastic narrator Luciana to her older sister Mari. It says, as the baby of our large Colombian American family, Luciana is usually relegated to the sidelines, but now she finds herself as the only voice of reason in the face of an unexpected crisis. A hurricane is heading straight for Miami and her eccentric grandmother, Abu, is refusing to evacuate. Abu is so one of a kind, she's basically in her own universe. And while she often drives Luciana nuts, they're the only ones who truly understand each other. So when Abu, normally glamorous and full of life, receives a shocking medical diagnosis during the storm, Luciana's world is upended. When Abu moves into Luciana's bedroom, their complicated bond intensifies. Luciana would rather be skating or sneaking out to meet girls, but Abu's wild demands and unpredictable antics are a welcome distraction for Luciana from her misguided mother, absent sister, and uncertain future. Forced to step into the role of caretaker, translator, and keeper of the devastating family secrets that Abu begins to share, Luciana suddenly finds herself center stage facing down adulthood and rising to the occasion. So again, it sounds like there's going to be some complicated family aspects to this. We have a granddaughter and her grandmother as they're moving in together. They're dealing with that complication and also secrets are being revealed. But like I said, this sounds like it's going to be uniquely told because it's going to be a series of one-sided phone calls from Luciana to her older sister. I don't know, that just sounded really intriguing to me. And it is a debut novel. And we know that Book of the Month loves their debut. So I wanted to mention it here. All right, moving on into the historical fiction category, I actually only have two that I wanna to talk to you about today. So this category is very, very light. The first book is called Their Divine Fires by Wendy Chen. It says, in 1917, at the dawn of the Chinese revolution, Yan Hong is growing up in the Southern China countryside and falls deeply in love with the son of a wealthy landlord despite her brother's objections. On the night of her wedding, her brother destroys the marriage, irrevocably changing the shape of Yan Hong's family to come. Her daughter, Yuexin, will never know her father. Haunted by a history that she does not understand, Yuexin passes on those memories to her daughters, Hong Xin and Yang Hong, who come of age in the years following Mao's death, battling the push and pull of political forces as they forge their own paths. Each generation guards its secrets, leaving Emily, great-granddaughter of Yang Hong, and living in contemporary America to piece together what actually happened between her mother and her aunt and the weight of their shared ancestry. So again, very complicated family drama. It sounds like it's going to be multi-generational as well. This is another one that's going to feature heavily marginalized voices. And so that's why this one really stood out to me and I wanted to mention it here. So this is really one of the only ones that made it on the list for historical fiction this time around. And the very final one for this category is a book called Spitting Gold by Carmelia Locus. Now this could potentially have a bit of a speculative element to it, but this is firmly set in historical period. So I wanted to go ahead and mention it in this category. It says Paris 1866, when Baroness Sylvie Devereaux receives a house call from Charlotte Moth, the sister she disowned. She fears her shady past as a spirit medium has caught up with her. But with their father ill and Charlotte unable to pay his bills, Sylvie is persuaded into one last con. Their marks are the de Jacquinots, dysfunctional aristocrats who believe they are haunted by their great aunt, brutally murdered during the French Revolution. The scheme underway, the sisters deploy every trick to terrify the family out of their goal. But when inexplicable horror starts to happen to them too, the duo questions whether they really are at the mercy of a vengeful spirit and what other deep dark secrets may come to light. Okay, yes. Yeah, so I don't know if there's actually going to be a speculative element, like if there's actually a vengeful spirit or not, but this is one that I've seen going around. It's definitely been getting a lot of buzz. And because of some of the clues that I've seen, I'm definitely leaning towards this one as a strong contender for historical fiction. So if this one sounds interesting to you, be on the lookout for it in May. All right, then moving on into the fantasy sci-fi slash magical realism category. This one is actually pretty full this time around. Usually we only have one or two selections, but we have quite a few strong contenders, starting with Goddess of the River by Vaishnavi Patel. Now Vaishnavi Patel's other release, Kakei, was a book of the month featured book. And so that is why I wanted to go ahead and include this one here because Kakei is definitely a very beloved story. It has definitely been going around. It is very, very popular at this point. It says Ganja, joyful goddess of the river, serves as caretaker to the mischievous godlings who roam her banks. But when their antics incur the wrath of a powerful sage, Ganja is cursed to become mortal, bound to her human form until she fulfills the obligations of the curse. Though she knows nothing of mortal life, Ganja weds King Shantanu and becomes a queen determined to regain her freedom no matter the cost. But in a cruel turn of fate, just as she is freed of her binding, she is forced to leave her infant son behind. Her son, Prince Devavrata, unwittingly carries the legacy of Ganja's curse. And when he makes an oath that he will never claim his father's throne, he sets in motion a chain of events that will end in a terrible and tragic war. As the years unfold, Ganja and Devavrata are drawn together again and again, each confluence another step on a path that has been written in the stars in this deeply moving and masterful tale of duty, destiny, and the unwavering bond between mother and son. So if you really enjoyed Kakei, the newest release from Vaishnavi Patel is coming out. And like I said, I think it's a very, very strong contender for Book of the Month in May. Another one that I've definitely seen going around is called The Ministry of Time by Colleen Bradley. It says, in the near future, a civil servant is offered the salary of her dreams and is shortly afterward told what project she'll be working on. A recently established government ministry is gathering expats from across history to establish whether time travel is feasible 
feasible for the body, but also for the fabric of space and time. She is tasked with working as a bridge, living with, assisting, and monitoring the expats known as 1847 or Commander Graham Gore. As far as history is concerned, Commander Gore died on Sir John Franklin's doomed 1845 expedition to the Arctic, so he's a little disoriented to be living with an unmarried woman who regularly shows her calves, surrounded by outlandish concepts such as washing machines, Spotify, and the collapse of the British Empire. But with an appetite for discovery, a seven-day cigarette habit, and the support of a charming and chaotic cast of fellow expats, he soon adjusts. Over the next year, what the bridge initially thought would be, at best, a horrifically uncomfortable roommate dynamic evolves into something much deeper. By the time the true shape of the Ministry's project comes to light, the bridge has fallen haphazardly, fervently in love, with consequences she never could have imagined. Forced to confront the choices that brought them together, what she does next can change the future. An exquisitely original and feverishly fun fusion of genres and ideas, the Ministry of Time asks, what does it mean to defy history when history is living in your house? So that actually sounds like a lot of fun. I'm really liking the tone and the vibe of this. This is definitely going to deal with time travel, but there's also a little bit of history thrown in and a little bit of snark and sarcasm and things like that. I'm not sure. Like I said, this sounds like it's going to be a very, very interesting genre blend. It has certainly been going around, and this is 100% a top contender for this category on Book of the Month in May. Another fantasy that has really been getting a lot of buzz lately is a book called Five Broken Blades by Mai Portland. This says, it is the season for treason and the king of Yusan must die. The five most dangerous liars in the land have been mysteriously summoned to work together for a single objective, to kill the god King Jun. Under his merciless and mortal hand, the nobles flourish while the poor and innocent are imprisoned, ruined, or sold. And now, each of the five blades will come for him. Each has tasted bitterness, from the hired hitman seeking atonement, a lovely assassin who seeks freedom, or even the prince banished for his cruel crimes. None can resist the sweet, icy lure of vengeance. They can agree on murder. They can agree on treachery. But for these five killers, each versed in deception, lies, and betrayal, it's not enough to forge an alliance. To survive, they'll have to find a way to trust each other, but only one can take the crown. Let the best liar win. So that sounds absolutely intriguing to me. If this is featured on Book of the Month, I don't necessarily know if I would pick it up because I don't like my fantasies in the Book of the Month edition. But like I said, this is a fantasy that has definitely been going around. I've heard a lot about it. It is definitely a vengeance story. It is a story of treason and I'm down for it. So this is certainly one that I'm excited to see as well. All right, everybody. Sorry if there was an angle change or anything like that. My camera overheated and I had to give it a minute to rest for a second, but I wanted to go ahead and finish out this video really quickly because I was almost done with it. But anyway, y'all, that is it. Those are just some of the books that I think could be featured on Book of the Month in May. As per usual, I am no expert at making these predictions, so if you think I neglected to mention some very strong contenders for Book of the Month, please feel free to leave them down below in the comments. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me a frog emoji in honor of the frogs on Spitting Gold. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to see you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below along with the books that I might talk about in a video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.